What's up, everyone? My name is Lauren Wilson. And as you can see here, I'm an ultra runner. I have run um, 50 miles at a sub seven minute per mile pace. I've run 100 kilometers at uh, about a seven minute, 15 second per mile pace. So that's 62 miles. Uh, I majored in exercise science at the University of Texas. I also was fortunate enough to run cross country and track at the University of Texas. I am the Run Lab Phoenix lead gait specialist, certified personal trainer, certified yoga instructor, art of breath certification, tons of certifications. I'm very, very passionate about just helping people live happier and healthier lives. And I'm so excited to talk to you guys today about running biomechanics 101, just some tangible tips to improve your running to day. So let's go ahead and dive right in because you did not get on here to, to listen to me talk about myself. So here we go. So this is the agenda. This is what we're going to be going through today. I'm going to introduce the, the phases of gait. We're going to talk about some of the, the myths out there and try to debunk some of them. So is there a right way to run? I'm going to equip you with some different assessments to help you develop body awareness and then equip you with some tools to troubleshoot what you find when you develop that, that body awareness and figure out where some of your limiters are. I'm going to talk about the, the future of, or what I believe is the future of running training and kind of the latest in exercise science, what, what it's, what the research is, some different common faults. And then we'll leave the presentation here with some hands-on application for you guys to start again, eradicating pain, increasing your volume and increasing your speed today. So let's go. So real quick, phases of gait, you have a loading response. So how well do you accept load when you're on one leg? So running, when you really look at it, it's just a series of single leg squats to hop over and over and over again. So when you hop and you land and you absorb all that load, how what does that look like? And then propulsion is once you accept that load, the ground reaction force enters your, your muscles, tendons, skeleton, how well do you take that force and turn it into forward momentum or propulsion? And then finally, your leg is going through, through swing phase. So here's just a couple looping. You can see it from the back, the front, and the side. So if we look at this video over here on the left, that loading response is from the time the foot hits the ground and all the weight goes on to one leg and then you can kind of see the loading response from the back and then is again from the from the front there and then again same videos what propulsion is if is once you accept all the load once the leg goes into extension the heel comes off the ground and then the rest of the foot comes off the ground you push off or toe off then you go from that toe off into swing phase. So what is the leg doing while it's in the air? So real quick, is there a right way to run? So part myth and part fact. And so when we think about the word right way to run, what you'll hear about a lot is these different methods like pose method or chi method, or you shouldn't heel strike, or you should run on your toes, or you should run like this all this, all this craziness, right? And none of it's completely 100% correct and none, none of it's 100% incorrect either. And so there's, there's general guiding exercise science principles where everything else derives from. And so the ideal running form is gonna be dictated by, for one, environment. So if you're running on the road versus running on a trail, that's the quickest metaphor and imagery that I can show you guys. That's going to be a completely different gait pattern. Running up a hill versus running on flat road, different gait pattern. Running an easy run um, versus like a, a faster run. So that goes down to goals. That's going to have a different, most efficient way to run. And then finally, your anatomy. So everyone's fingerprints are completely different. Everyone looks different. Everyone's skeleton is also slightly different. And if you were made a certain way, your running mechanics aren't going to look 
the same as someone else who's built a completely different way. So sometimes some of us have externally rotated feet or hips, or some of us have valgus knees. And so the question becomes for the practitioner that's doing the assessment on you is, is this anatomical in terms of this is just how you were born and we and there's not a lot we can do to change the situation? Or is this more functional? That means that you have a tight muscle or a tight tendon or a joint is kind of misaligned. And that is something that we can work on to improve with, with drastic measures, right? So again, your environment, your goals, and your anatomy are going to dictate for you in that specific moment in time, what is the ideal running form. And so let's have a, a, a little bit clearer demonstration here. So sprinting versus distance running, right? So goal-driven running form. Sprinting, the goal of sprinting is max power output. The goal of distance running is efficiency or energy conservation, right? If you're just sprinting a 100 meter or 200 meter dash, yes, efficiency matters, but that's not the, the, the hierarchy or the top goal. It's all about power output. How can I get across the line the fastest? Whereas if I'm running a marathon, that's going to take me a couple hours. I want to be as efficient, not as big of movements because I'm trying to conserve energy. And so the, the physics equation for power is force times displacement divided by time. So when the foot hits the ground or when the body comes in contact with the ground, how much power am I putting from my body into the ground? The displacement is of the mass. And in this situation, the mass is the human subject. So how far in space is the mass being displaced and then divided by time? So when you do division, if you divide by a smaller number, that increases the, the what that number equals. Whereas if the time is larger, if you divide by a larger number, the outcome is going to be smaller, right? So you want to decrease the amount of time that your body is on the ground, that's how you produce more power. So when we look at Usain Bolt, the world record holder in the 100, and we look at Ilya Kipchoge, the greatest marathoner of all time, both elite runners, but they have different goals. Usain Bolt, he's landing more on the balls of his feet. He's landing more on his toes because he's trying to decrease the amount of time that he's on the ground. You can see his arm carriage. He has bigger, he's pumping his arms with bigger amplitude. His legs, he's picking up his legs. He's driving his knees with larger amplitude. Whereas Kipchoge, you see his arms are more contained closer to his rib cage, closer to his core. And you can see his foot strike is more flat compared to being up on the balls of his feet. And so some general principles to extract from this demonstration is just very quickly, if you're in a sports car, right? So sprinting mechanics, more on the balls of the feet, more on the toes. That's going to be quicker, bigger amplitudes in my limbs, my arms and my legs. For distance running, more efficiency. So maybe more like a, like a minivan for your kids and for your family or a suburban, high-end suburban. More on the midfoot, maybe even on the bottom of the heel, not the back of the heel, but bottom of the heel to midfoot, smaller amplitudes, et cetera. And so let's go ahead and go on. So overarching themes common to everyone's running gait. Once again, just to reiterate, all running is when we look at it is it's a series of single leg squats to hop over and over and over again. And so the 10 components of gait training, which is what everyone is going to be working on when they're doing gait retraining, right? When you're trying to learn a new movement skill, all that movement skill is, it's a, it's a snapshot in time, in that moment of all the underlying physiology and biology that is happening. And that changes from moment to moment. And the, and the quickest example of that is, let's say you're not motivated in that moment, or you didn't sleep well the night before, you didn't eat well. Well, that's going to manifest itself in your mechanics in that moment in time. And so you may not necessarily have bad mechanics on a day-to-day -day basis, but in that moment of time, due to the circumstances, you do. And so you can kind of see how this starts to get complex pretty quickly. And so the 10 components of, of gait training, 
one is called your your physiological state so your nervous system your your motivation in the moment are you fasting or or are you are you well fueled uh what are your stress levels are you run down are you excited all of that is going to affect how your running mechanics manifest themselves in that moment next is posture so so joint stacking and what is your posture like from uh, head to toe while you are running and are you able to maintain those proper angles one statically are you able to just stand there and sit there on a day-to-day -day basis with good posture and then are you able to hold good posture dynamic so as you move your body through space and are you able to understand what we're looking for there elasticity or musculotendon health so how elastic how much of that rubber band effect am i getting in my muscles and in my in my tendons? Am I getting any of it? Am I taking advantage of gravity and the elastic properties in my body? What is my muscular endurance? If I'm very fatigued, that's going to manifest itself in a completely different fashion than if I'm fresh. So the beginning of a, a race versus the end of the race, my muscular endurance, what is my mobility or what is my range of motion? Do I have the necessarily necessary range of motion from head to toe throughout my body to execute the movement pattern that I'm trying to execute. And then once I have that proper range of motion, do I have the strength and the power over that range of motion at each end range of the range of motion to once again, execute the movement pattern, um, nervous system. So this one is coordination are my body parts. So if you look at running, you're rotating in your left arm and your right leg and vice versa, so it's what we call a contralateral exercise. So my left side and my right side are working together to coordinate the movement. Do you have that, that coordination? So a quick example of that that I, that I always like to use is I could watch Steph Curry dribble all day long and I could want to dribble like him all day long. But if I don't have the necessary underlying coordination, it does not matter. I'm never going to be able to move like that. Next is stability or balance, but we, we try to avoid balance because balance is a form of stability. Um, stability is more, do I have stability in the necessary spots, like through my core, through my spine, in my shoulder, in my feet, and then do I have good balance as well? And a lot of times people lack stability because it's not really the, the sexy, fun thing to do. A lot of times we'll hit the weight room. We want to do big exercises such as squats, bench press, deadlift. We want to do abdominals because we want to work on those mirror muscles. And we often neglect just challenging our balance because they're not as fun. They take a lot of focus and they humble us really, really quickly. But they're going to be a lot of bang for your buck because let's say you're on one leg and you're super wobbly. Well, what that means is the force can't efficiently transfer through your entire body, it's being leaked out. So imagine that you're uh, just like in a building, if a building was shaking, you wouldn't want the building to, to necessarily shake, right? You would want it to be as stable as possible. Same thing when you're, when you're running, you want to be able for a split second, be as stable as possible to efficiently take that load through your body. Next is strength. And so what this is, is do I have the necessary max power output? Do I have the, the capability to produce the absolute amount of force through my, my muscles and through my tendons and through my skeleton to execute the movement? Symmetry between the left and the right side. A lot of us are probably 99% of us are asymmetrical. So we do have imbalances between the left and the right side, completely normal. However, we do, we work to be aware of those asymmetries and then we work to, to work around that. So is, can we get the body in as much balance as possible to kind of even out the stress distribution of running, or is this something that we can't avoid? So we need to strengthen the areas in our body that are taking on more load. And then finally breath. So breathing is a skill. And so being able to develop the musculature around the lungs, using the diaphragm, using the abdominals, being able to develop the coordination of using our nose and using our mouth and getting control over our breathing, getting in a rhythm with our breathing. So 
those are all the components. Everyone's going to be working on those components in some faucet. Those are the foundations that are applicable to everybody. And then everyone's just at a different level, again, depending on their environment, their goals and their, their anatomy, which, which level they're working at in those different things. And then over here, the training pyramid techs, uh, specifically, usually you would work on mobility first, balance and stability, muscular endurance, muscular strength, muscular pattern, and then finally putting it all together into the sports specific movement skill. In this case, distance running, but let's say you're playing basketball or soccer or football, it would be the same training methodology for those movement skills as well. So real quick, applying the components of gait training in the stages of motor learning. So with any movement skill, but again, we're talking about running, there, there's phases of motor learning and the end of it is muscle memory. So pretty much the path to develop muscle memory or unconscious ability to execute a movement pattern. It's a default bias response through so much repetition or with so much intensity that it's baked in and you don't even have to think about it anymore. And now you can direct that, that energy, that nervous system energy to other tasks or other things. And that's the end goal because once it's baked into muscle memory, it's so efficient, you don't even have to think about it anymore. So when you first come in to try to change your running form, you have what's called unconscious incompetence. So you something is, is inefficient. My body's not in balance, but I don't know what it is, right? I'm not conscious of where my limiters are. Then once you get analyzed, once you get assessed by a practitioner or an expert, and they tell you where your limiters are, you move into the next phase, which is conscious incompetence. So now I am aware of where my limitations are, where my inefficiencies are, and where my imbalances are. Then you move into what's called conscious competence. So when we start tweaking your running form, when we start making changes to your running form, it is going to feel very awkward. It is going to be it is an enjoyable experience, but it's not in terms of it's a lot of work. And this is the best way to explain it. You have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. I can't even repeat enough how many thousands of repetitions you have with your current movement patterns. Think about it. If for, for math's sake, if one step in a running gait pattern is one meter long, there is 1,609 meters in a mile. So every mile you're getting 1,600 repetitions in. Now multiply that over a run, over a day, over a year, over a lifetime. That's, again, it's it, you can't even count that high. That's what we're trying to override. So we have to go in there, debug that software program, take that software program out and instill this new one. And again, it's do I have the range of motion, the power, the strength, the coordination, all of that has to be overridden and reprogrammed. And so minor changes are going to feel huge. But when you watch yourself with the film and the feedback, you're going to be like, wow, that was only one inch because your body, most processes are unconscious. It, it needs to save as much energy as possible for survival. And so movement patterns, most of those are just baked in. So for instance, if you were to take a paralyzed person from the waist down and just pull their leg back into extension, they'll take a few steps automatically. That's how deeply baked in it is into muscle memory. Uh, even a paralyzed person will take a few steps if you put their leg in the right position. And so that's what you're trying to override. And so that's very energy dependent. But once you, once you do all the exercises, once you get the reps in, once you get the body awareness in, eventually it will start to get easier and it will start to enter that muscle memory phase. So that's the beautiful thing about our bodies is even though we do have thousands of repetitions, we can override it in a relatively short period of time. We usually see really great progress in 12 to 16 weeks. That's usually when you'll start to see those changes really start to get baked in to the muscle memory as the strength starts to catch up, the range of motion and the coordination as well. And then finally, unconscious competence, which is the goal at the end of the day, muscle memory. But even then, right, this is a lifetime. You're continuing to work on your efficiencies because if you don't, if you stop, those inefficiencies will just come right back. 
and then just bringing conscious attention when you get fatigued. Let's say you're at the end of a marathon, no matter what level you're at, even if you're the world record holder, what you do at that point is you're armed with the, the awareness of where your limitations are, what your compensation movement patterns are, and you do a body scan head to toe to see what those movement mechanics are looking like. And if you have the muscular endurance, then you can consciously change to maintain that good form all the way through the finish line. So awareness assessments and toolkits. So quick assessments, breath and body scan. So am I breathing from my diaphragm? Are my muscle and my are my stomach and my back both expanding and then coming on in? Are, where are my shoulders? Are they even? Are my legs staying apart? Is one arm, are my arms moving forward and back? Are my legs moving forward and back? Or do I have any abnormal winging in my arms or ab any abnormal winging in my feet? Um, good static posture assessment. So do, when I'm standing there, are, is my ear stacked over my shoulder, stacked over my hip? stacked over my knee, stacked over my ankle bone, or do I have rounded shoulders? Am I shifting forward onto the balls of my feet? What does my static posture look like? Doing a, a deep squat. So standing on both legs, doing a deep squat. Can I keep my heels on the ground? Can I keep my weight on my heels? Do I lean forward? Do my knees cave in? What is going on there? Does one arm drop forward uh, more than the other? Deep lunge stretch. So you're getting into the lunge position, a split leg position, pulling one leg back, reaching up and over with the arm uh, that has the leg back and trying to assess your hip tightness or range of motion is one hip or are my obliques and abdominals on one side more tight than another side? So am I overusing one side than the other? Single leg squat. Can you get into a full pistol squat? Not many people can. However, uh, if you do, it just opens up more work capacity for you. T-spine rotation. So are you able to sit there with a bar on your shoulders and rotate to the left, rotate to the right? Is there any restrictions in rotation one way versus the, the other? Scratch test. So kind of you're going here. One arm is down. One arm is up. Can you touch the fingers like so? And then you reverse it. And then if you can't touch, you're going to want to go ahead and search for the tight spots in the pec and around the shoulder blade and to get those fingers to touch um, behind. And then finally, last but not least, just slow down your running form. Do a slow motion run. Again, it's just a series of single leg squats to hop over and over and over again. Do you have good balance? when you're doing it slow. If you don't have good balance in a slow motion run progression, then that shows you that you're compensating in your running form and using momentum and using secondary and tertiary muscles to do the primary muscles job. And you're compensating through the movement because your body, think about it. It's a survival mechanism. It's going to do whatever it takes to get away from that, that bear, that lion, that saber tooth. And so even if you have poor movement mechanics, you're going to be able to still run. So that just gives you quick insight into that. Once you find those tight spots, let's use a foam roller or maybe get some soft tissue work done by a massage therapist or a chiropractor or physical therapist. Mobilize the spot, get your body back to where it needs to be. Activate through using strength exercises, nervous system exercises. You can change your states using breath. So going back to the quick assessment with your, with your breathing, your, your breathing rate is directly tied to your nervous system rate. And, and when you think about it for a second, that makes sense. If you're working out at a vi very high intensity, what happens? Your breathing rate goes up. And so many of us were so stressed on a day-to-day -day basis that just sitting there, our breathing rate and our heart rates are just elevated. So if you can just slow down your breathing, make the exhale longer than the inhale, a really just common way is just do a, a, a four count in, hold for four, and then an eight count out. That's going to activate what we call the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest, digest nervous system. And that's what's going to help aid with recovery. And, and you can increase the hyperventilate on your own, but be careful, consult with a doctor before you do that to get more excited or slow down the breath to calm your, your stress. And then again, reassess and then know when to call it and change it up. So what I mean by that is 
you might have the best coach in the world, but the body is so complex on a day-to-day basis. What we're doing is we're using data, we're using historical data, and we're using statistics to make the best judgment call for that day. But at the end of the day, you're the only one that is with your body. And so let's say you wake up, you have a higher heart rate, you're a little bit more stressed because of, of work. You've done some breath work to try to calm down your nervous system, get yourself ready. You go through your warm up routine. You have to be able to make the judgment call in that moment. Do I do the assigned workout? And that's going to put me because I'm in I'm in a proper state. Or if I do this assigned workout and don't change it up, I'm going to put myself in a bigger hole and it's going to take me longer to recover. So those are the decisions that you have to make on a day to day basis. And a coach and a team can help you with that. But at the end of the day, it's your body. You're the only one there and you have to develop the self awareness to help with your own training and making sure it's progressing in a safe manner so that you don't plateau or worse, get injured and have to um, sit out. So future of top runners. So all the research is showing that the, the old debate of does a kid specialize as early as possible in a sport similar to, to Tiger Woods. And again, this is just using statistics. So these are statistical norms with the bell curve. You will always have those outliers like Tiger Woods, who started playing golf from age three years old and became the best in the world. Statistically speaking, though, that is not the norm. There should be no specialization at an early age. And what you should be doing with younger athletes is focusing on overall athleticism. And this same concept should apply to adults as well. Overall athleticism is the base on which everything else is built upon. So the ability to be agile, the ability to to be as strong as possible, as powerful as possible, as quick as possible, to be able to throw objects, to sprint, spending time outside in nature, getting uh, working the creativity in your brain, all of this stuff will man- uh, help you with your performance in the long run because that is the foundation. So often a lot of us just run, 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 And that is a very catabolic exercise. It not only breaks down your muscles and your joints, if it's not backed with athletic looking movements, it also just can wreck your metabolism and your hormones as well. So there's a lot of benefits to having an athletic base built into your weekly programming. Uh, Next thing, huge aerobic base with years of uninterrupted training in multiple athletic disciplines. So for instance, not only are these kids playing a lot of sports, um, they're also swimming. They're also biking. They're just playing tag outside rather than sitting inside and playing video games all day. They're just active for hours and hours, but it's not structured activity. It's recreational. It's fun activity so that it's playful, and that's what's going to allow them to build that huge uninterrupted aerobic base. Training will include specialization once it's time to peak. So a really good example of this actually is the top miler in the world, Jakob Interbinksen from Norway, uh, Olympic gold medalist and everything. He actually growing up did train distance running, did train at a very high level, but he also participated in the jumps and other exercises in track and like steeplechase and stuff. And now, now that he's older and a professional runner in his 20s, he still does a lot of athletic looking things. However, he most of his training is specifically for his events, the mile and the 5K. And so that's what's going to happen. And then in his off season, though, he's working on his athleticism. He's working on these other attributes. And then once the season comes and he gets closer and closer to his peak event, all of his training is going to be specializing just to be as fast as possible in those events per se. Uh, there's going to be no stone unturned. So even myself, I'm I'm 33. I graduated high school in 2008. All of this stuff is is all in the last decade or so. I went to the University of Texas. We were not talking about biomechanics even when I was at the University of Texas. But kids these days with social media and the internet, that's one of the positives of it is in this information age is they can work on their biomechanics. They're doing breath work. They're, they're gaining self-awareness of their, of their physiology and how to hack it. They're using infrared saunas, cold plunges. They're journaling. They're really focusing on their mental health, spiritual health. 
And all of that is maximized and the nutrition component and how it affects our, our mental states and our performance as well. And there's just the, the body is so complex, right? We don't even really know what consciousness is yet. So there's so many stones left unturned that I feel that we haven't even gotten close to what the human potential is, especially in, in distance running. Um, right now, what's going on, what you're seeing is lactic threshold testing. So lactate itself is a metabolic fuel. It's a byproduct. So once you start to run out of carbs, you start to produce lactate to use as a fuel. And lactate itself isn't bad. What happens is if you're not able to uptake it fast enough, it starts to accumulate in the muscle. And that is when it becomes bad. So training, though, right at that edge where you're able to uptake that lactate, that's kind of been the latest breakthrough in training because they have affordable for the masses, lactate testers, so that you can test your lactate on a day-to-day, run-to-run, workout-to-workout basis to make sure you're always in that optimal zone. And that's really how the Norwegians have broken through recently to compete with the Africans at the highest global stage. Also, wearable technology, it's only getting better and better and better. And they're only figuring out more and more and more as they collect that data, as AI gets better at crunching data and making use of that data using um, data analysis and statistics. Wearables are only going to get better at coaching us. The human aspect will never be taken out because robots just cannot feel yet mental health and spiritual health at the same level as a human but ever, it is going to be an amplification of performance, that wearable ecosystem. And then finally, having a pit crew around you, just like it is here at Run Lab. You are the vehicle. You are the car. You have a chiropractor. You have a physical therapist. You have a nutritionist. You have your wearables. You have your coach. You have your biomechanics expert. Everyone is working together in collaboration to make sure you have the running experience that you want. And so that's really, really exciting. That future is actually happening right now. Run Lab has been doing it for a decade and people still aren't really uh, joining us in that that sphere quite yet, but we are hoping that others join because we believe that this should be available to as many people as possible. Hands-on applications here just to kind of finish this up. Um, so incorporating into warm-up. So once you become self-aware, kind of where your limiters are and you get your exercises to incorporate. Let's say you're you're strapped for time like most of us are because we're not professional athletes. Incorporating your drills into warm-ups and cooldowns is a really really good way not to only get the reps in to override your current software program. It's a good way to really just get the body ready for the movement that it's about to perform. Um or right you can actually increase the intensity Because it's volume, reps, times intensity. That's how fast you're going to bake in a movement pattern without getting injured. So if you can make it into a workout itself, you are going to learn it a lot faster than if you just incorporate drills into warm-ups and cool-downs. However, for the sake of time, that's just a little tip for you as well. Uh, And then finally here, I guess we have some more. Common faults in each phase of the gait cycle. So loading response, propulsion, and swing. Loading response Um, from the side, really what we see is an overstride. So that's this one here on the left. So an overstride is where that leg is hitting like too far out in front of your knee and you're landing like on the back of the heel. You really want more your foot to land right underneath your knee. And then we kind of watch where am I um, when I'm at maximum triple flexion. So when all of my weights on my leg and I'm flex at the ankle, the knee and the hip, where is the position of my body in rel- in, rel- in relation to my leg? From the back, really what we're looking at is are the are the hips staying even? Is everything moving kind of forward and back? And then from the front, kind of same thing. Is everything, what's the left and the right look like? Is everything kind of moving forward and back? What is my landing angle or my inversion angle, right? So if you kind of think of an airplane landing, doesn't land too far on the on the nose, doesn't land too far on the tail, kind of comes in a little bit flat like that, looking at the symmetries between the left and the right side. So how well am I absorbing that load? That's going to directly affect how well I push off. So that's kind of the next thing we're looking at is the timing of the heel coming off the ground, the timing of the toe off, 
when the leg completely comes off the ground? Um, is it efficient there from all angles? And then last but not least, swing phase. What what path is my leg taking through the air? Is everything moving forward and back? Uh, is everything kind of getting lift off the ground? Do I have too much vertical oscillation? So what is my horizontal translation forward versus my vertical oscillation up and down? What is my upper body doing when my body's in the air um, during swing phase? And then what is my left versus my right side look like? So thank you for watching. I hope that you guys got a lot of value from this content, from this video today. And um, we love to do this. If you're in the Phoenix, Glendale, Scottsdale area, we love to give free educational talks. This is just one version of it, but we have a lot of different ones. So if you want us to do a free educational talk for your business group, your running group, or your running store, we would love to do that. Uh, we provide drinks and snacks as well. If you are a certified personal trainer, we have continuing education credits. So be on the lookout for that if you'd like to dive in even deeper, not only learning and nerding out on running, but also getting some continuing education credits. Uh, check us out on that as well. So once again, thank you so much for your time. Love you guys. Happy running. Let's go.